I want to talk just very finally about this touring thing because your fans want to see you live again. You want to be remembered as a singer. When are you going back on tour? Oh, you're making me feel guilty now, aren't you? <laughs> I would. I have. I've been asked. I probably will. I pro. There are times when I think I wish I was more like Shirley, Shirley Bassey, um, which is, it's her life. I have to stress again. It's show business. I remember my husband saying. You don't work for the business, you make the business work for you. And you've got to remember, I'm very much a family person. And I do have two beautiful grandchildren uh, who I want to spend every hour that God sends me to be with Max and Lana. I just, it's a, I'm in a different era now. And I would do, I would do that um, charity concert, but it means me having to work. I mean, I'd have to have. I mean, I don't even sing in the shower now. Never mind, you know. Um, I'd never play my own records. I never ever do that. I'd be embarrassed. I mean, I did an advert for LV, and every time it comes on, an insurance advert, oh, I have to switch over. I can't bear to watch myself on television or even listen to myself. But I love entertaining the public. I love that. And I promise you, I will do a concert. <laughs> uh, I've got to now, haven't I? We have really, for the sake of your eulogy and for your fans. I mean, you can't have the singer if you're not singing. Oh, well, all right. But I mean, Alfie is bloody hard to do these <laughs> days. I mean, I could never, I'll have to take it down a few notches. I, can't, I couldn't reach that high note. I'm sure they'll still love you nevertheless. <laughs> Let's talk in our very final moments about the greatest thing that's ever happened to you in show business, aside from the family, which is obviously Obviously, your priority and your great love. What was the moment in show business when you went, this is it, this is the moment? Oh, um, it wasn't any of the number ones or any of the big hits. Uh, when I really thought that I had arrived is when I, I was invited to do my very first Royal Command performance. That was in 64. And I remember uh, it was the doorman and he was always right. He said, you're going to be doing the Royal Command this year. And I said, oh, don't be silly. I've only been in show business nine months. You know, uh, he said, no, I've got, I've tipped you. You're going to be on the Royal Command. And lo and behold, he was right. He was absolutely right. Because uh, I am a royalist anyway. Uh, always was. My family were. And I remember when at about nine, maybe I was 11, the Queen came to Liverpool. And I swore to God that it was me she was waving at. Me? She waved at me. <laughs> and all the crowds coming down Scotty Road, I, I was convinced it was me. And to actually meet the Queen was absolutely incredible. And to perform for the Queen. And in those days, in the early 60s, one had to, you had to wear gloves. And it was terribly grand. And she wore gloves as well. I mean, you never press the flesh. It was, I was wearing shocking pink and gloves right up to my elbows. And it was absolutely fascinating. And I was appearing at the Palladium at the time with Frankie Vaughan and Tommy Cooper, great Bill. And you know, my photograph was like nine feet tall outside. And I remember the first question she asked me, what are you doing at the moment? I thought, is she blind? Couldn't she see the pictures outside? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the billboards, you know, starring Silla Black. And I, I just went, I never ever forget that though. I never, what am I doing at the minute? Well, apart from performing here, I couldn't believe that. But that was my proudest moment, I guess. Um, of course, I've met her several times since then. All of them, actually. And of course, recently at the Royal Variety, you were on with Paul in the most fabulous outfit. That was something to behold and remember, wasn't it? Oh, that was great. That was a little bit of um, history. I don't think we, we could ever top that. Because um, I think the public generally didn't um, believe that I, you know, I could, I could do that kind of thing. Or they weren't expecting it. it but that was really a naughty surprise. And it was a terrible, terribly naughty. It had gone wrong all day. I mean, the outfit, you know, my the outfit that lit up. 
And I was working that myself. I had to do that myself. It wasn't someone off. For it, those who didn't see it, it lit up in strategic places. It did, yes. Well, we were doing, <laughs> I was playing a part from Gypsy, Miss Electra from Gypsy. And it was called You Gotta Get a Gimmick. And, you know, you got to get a gimmick with a oomph and a oomph and a oomph, oomph, oomph. And three different phases. My boobs lit up. And then my crotch lit, lit up. <laughs> and then I bent over and my bum lit up, uh, which was very funny. It was straight from the musical Gypsy. So I was playing a part. That wasn't Scylla. But then I remember the producer and director of the show was um, Jeff, Jeff Thacker. And I was being dressed, you know, in the leotard and everything. And I kept saying, oh, lower down on the bum and lower down on the thighs. And all the time he was saying to Stephen Adnish, higher on the thighs and higher, <laughs> could higher on the thighs and could higher on the bum line. <laughs> And so on the day of the it arrived with all the um, the the pack in the the radio pack, which was quite heavy actually. Um, it was all the, fa the outfit was fabulous, but it never worked once. The lights never came on at all, and I swear. And I thought, well, I can do it without lights. I don't have to light up. I can still do the number. So there was a guy with all the wires going up on the leotard. Um, an hour at 7.30 in the evening kneeling on the floor in my dressing room soldiering these wires in the leotard and I remember Jeff and uh, my son Robert standing in the wings going, when the first lights went on oh god it's working because they hadn't worked all the way through and of course it brought the house down and that's the glamour of show business, isn't it? Oh, well, that is, as they say, <laughs> that's show business, folks. <laughs> My final question to you is, I can't understand how people make show business so difficult. You were, without question, in the 90s, the biggest star on TV, certainly at ITV. Before that, you were a star in your own right for many, many reasons, and you still are today. How do you manage to deal with it and not be into the drugs and not be completely bonkers and not be going into rehab when so many seem to find what is the greatest privilege and most fun job in the world the most difficult thing to do? It's a different time we're living in altogether. But I always say, what I always say, if you don't want it, don't do it. Look, if you don't want the press... The media is so, so, so intrusive today. I love, I mean, the media have always been great with me, by the way. But I always say, if you don't want it, don't go there. Don't really go there. You know, go behind closed doors, have private parties, um, you know, and the drug thing, that's what really bothers me. But the drugs were always there. But the thing is, even in the early days, well, as you know, the 60s, you know, make love not war and all the rest of it but I had I couldn't do any of that because you know why ego ego they were all cl they were all groups remember I was a single artist so if someone was out of it on stage in a band someone else would cover for them I had no cover at all so but myself so I had a responsibility and my ego was far too large to get involved plus the fact I was frightened I was terrified of drugs. I really was. Um, I remember being at a party. <laughs> and everybody was there. I can say it now. The Beatles, the Moody Blues, blah de blah every, you name it, all these bands were there. And this spliff was being handed round on a pin. And I thought, it's been in everybody else's mouth. It ain't going in mine. It has one mouth. It ain't going in. I didn't smoke anyway. So... That was a blessing, really. But I, I don't know. I think I turned on once or had a... Yeah, it was once. I didn't like it. It didn't do anything to me. And it was it's bad for the throat and probably bad for your health anyway. So, I mean, I, I, I tried to be a naughty girl, but it didn't work for me. But today, it's I feel sorry for, you know, your Amy Winehouses. Because I think she's an incredible, such an incredible talent really 
Um, and it's just so hard to see her destroy herself the way she has been. I mean, it comes to something when uh, she was nicked in Norway and her family and friends said, oh, what a re how relieved they were. That was just cannabis. I, you know, I would totally be horrified by that. But, I mean, I hope she, she comes through it because it'd be a sheer waste of talent. And it's so sad that they haven't got that support network around them who can step in and say, you're going too far, enough's enough, because I presume in your day there was enough people around you, including Bobby, who would have given you a slap if you'd have gone too far. The thing is, you can only get help if people come to you for, for help. No point... Look, when a smoker, even cigarettes... They can't, nobody can give up smoking for you. You have to do it for yourself and you've got to want to do it. At the minute, you know, a lot of young people don't want to do it, don't want to do it. So they can, you know, to help yourself, you've got to ask for help for other people. Scylla, so, you're so loved. Please do the live tour. Thank you so much for allowing me into your home to do this exclusive hour special. We're really, really grateful. And uh, all the years of asking has paid off. Thank you for your time. Uh, good luck in the future and enjoy yourself in Barbados as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. It's a pleasure.